Hey there, welcome back to The Magic and the Music. I'm Jen. You know, last night we went out, we took our family, our two kids, out to see Walt Disney Studios' newest animated feature film, Encanto. This is actually their 60th animated feature film, and it came out in theaters on November 24th, and it is set to be released on Disney Plus on December 24th. So for those of you who celebrate Christmas, this might be a really nice Christmas gift for you. So is it worth it? Should you watch it? Should you pay for it versus waiting for it to come out on Disney Plus? We've got our spoiler-free review for you. Tell us in the comments below if you have seen Encanto yet or if you plan to see it in theaters. All right, let's start things off by talking about the setting. Encanto is a film set in a magical version of Colombia. It's unclear whether this is supposed to be in modern times or not. Maybe it doesn't even matter if it's in modern times or not. Um, this is in a little village that is extremely isolated, and it's in a valley that has like these really extremely steep mountains isolating it from other places. So I guess it's irrelevant whether it's modern day or not. Um, it's definitely Colombia because it is stated outright uh, in, you know, there's a song that has, that sings about the country of Colombia. So it is definitely located there and they are very open about that fact. Um, so it's not a made up place like uh, Frozen where they're in Arendelle, which is a lot like Norway. Uh, this is definitely Colombia. I think it's really cool to have a film set in South America. And I really loved this setting because they were able in the story to incorporate a lot of the wildlife and plant life and things that are native to Colombia. So that was really, really beautiful. So the main character in this story is a young woman named Mirabel, um, Mirabel Madrigal, and her family has been blessed with magical powers, and each one gets their own magical power. When they are children, they go through a magical special ceremony, and their magical power is revealed to them, all of them except for Mirabel. So um, in the film, we see her struggle with being the only non-super in a family of supers, basically, so to borrow a term from The Incredibles. Honestly, she seems to handle it pretty well, uh, but as you can expect, repressing all your real feelings is not maybe the best long-term strategy. Mirabel is surrounded by an exciting cast of characters, um, both of magical and non-magical, we'll call them muggles, <laughs> who married into the family. Um, I guess this must make Mirabel a squib. It is awesome to see a character that's sort of princess-ish, I guess, princess adjacent. She's maybe princess adjacent. I mean, her family is magical, and that's like almost as good as royal. Maybe that's better than royal, actually. Anyway, it's great to see a Latina female lead who isn't just on a Disney Junior show. I'm talking to you, Elena of Avalor, who, honestly, she's cool, but probably won't have the staying power of Mirabel. I mean, it is no comparison to have your own Disney Junior show versus having your own feature-length Disney film and being the protagonist of that film. I would say Mirabel wins in this situation. I love Elena of Avalor. She's cool but she's just probably not gonna have the staying power. I'm sorry if she just has a, a TV show for little kids, you know, it's probably not gonna last as much as a full feature length film. Will they make Mirabel a princess? I don't think so. I mean, she's technically not a princess, so I don't think they're gonna like add her as a princess, but anyway, I'm just glad she gets to kind of like join the party. Okay, here's a spoiler free review of the plot. I promise I won't ruin anything. Um, I really liked that this story was not predictable. It doesn't go the way that you would really expect. And there really isn't like a traditional villain. And I'm totally fine with that because in real life, we don't really usually have actual villains. Things are just a little bit more complicated. It's complicated. And this film actually reflects that and kind of acknowledges that. I do think as a result of having a little bit of a less traditional plot, the pacing feels just a little bit different to me. It's actually a pretty short film. The runtime is only 109 minutes and it, it, it felt a little bit short to me, but still very, very enjoyable. Another thing that's really interesting about Encanto is that it is very tightly focused film. Um, some, a lot of things like take Moana, for example, which you could, uh, it's kind of analogous. You could make a lot of comparisons. That is a journey, right? So hero's journey, they go off somewhere to un areas unknown. 
Uh, Encanto is much more introspective and much more focused around family. And not, again, in a way that like Coco is, where Coco is about family, yet he goes on a journey. This is a much tighter narrative, and it keeps things very, very tight and focused and um, doesn't wander literally or figuratively. Okay, you knew I had to talk about the music, right? Because, hey, we're the magic in the music. I'm a music teacher. I'm all about it. So this film features eight original songs, and they are a mix of both Spanish and English. They're composed by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who we, of course, love. He's done lots of great Disney things and great things beyond Disney, too, with a score as well by Jermaine Franco. The soundtrack has been released a week ahead of the full theatrical release of the film. So obviously, we downloaded it right away, and we've been listening to it for the entire week ahead of seeing it, our kids and, and me. The kids were really excited about about the soundtrack. They loved it. They were already walking around the house singing the tunes. Lin-Manuel Miranda definitely hit the nail on the head in terms of creating a world of fun, memorable, singable tunes that enhance the story. There is no doubt that it definitely does that. I actually liked how much this really was a musical, and that was kind of one of my fears. When we had Raya and the Last Dragon last year in March, I enjoyed that film a lot, and I thought it was a really beautifully crafted film. But because it wasn't a real musical, I mean, it wasn't a musical, it, it left me kind of just wanting something more, and, and I was a little bit unsatisfied. It's a great film, but I just, you know, I want a musical. And so I came into this one just hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, that it was really going to, like, the music was going to help advance the narrative, and it really did that. Like, it feels like a musical in the way that Beauty and the Beast does or Aladdin does, and I really, really liked that. So the music was not secondary or occasional. It was deeply embedded in the storytelling. It has the exposition opening number that is a lot like Beauty and the Beast, uh, where you have this exposition, like we're going to introduce everyone. But that's classic musical theater. Like that's what you do. You introduce everybody. You have a big cast, full cast number, and you meet all the characters. And that's exactly what they did in this show. And I loved it. So you would expect that from a stage musical and it felt like it translated really well to the film. Now, I know some people might be thrown off by that, but as a musical theater fan, I actually really, really like that. And as always, Lin-Manuel Miranda seems to always do that thing where he takes contemporary musical influences and he blends them in a way that works in a non-contemporary setting. I know, duh, Hamilton, right? Of course. He did it again and made it connect and made it resonate. So, you know, hey, that's what he does best. Keep doing your thing. Some specific musical moments that really stood out for me was that my family particularly enjoyed Luisa's song, Surface Pressure. Um, she sings in a lower register for especially the beginning of the song, and it reflects her larger-than-life character. I sometimes, like, vocally, I feel like it's just maybe a little tiny bit forced for her, but then she gets up into a higher register, and it, clearly she really shines up there. Um, there is a lot of word painting in this song, and it's distinctly uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. If you haven't heard it yet, as soon as you hear it, you'll be like, oh, this is like, I'm getting Hamilton vibes from this or In the Heights, you know. So it, it's a really fun song. And um, also just really fun to hear the vocalists singing differently than you would normally expect to hear. A lot of female vocalists don't get parts this low. So it was really kind of fun <laughs> to, hear, to hear that as well. So yeah, love you, Louisa. You're cool. So that was a really, really fun song in the score, and it even had like some little references in that sequence to Hercules, and um, it had uh, also, like the whole sequence felt a lot like You're Welcome, kind of, from Moana, where it's kind of this like fantasy um, world where they're kind of going from one thing to the next thing, and it's not really rooted in the reality, it's kind of like in their heads, um, and I really enjoyed it. I also really liked Isabella's song, uh, What Else Can I Do? Because it has like a pop flavor and it reflects her obsession with putting on a perfect appearance. It has a lot of clever lyrics in the song and I felt like the style really fit because that's not to say that pop music is always perfect, but pop music is, you know, kind of meant to be a little bit more surface level, a little more superficial. And that's kind of what she's commenting on in the song. So I think it, it actually is a really, really good fit. Okay, I also have to point out that it's really cool that Mirabel plays accordion in this movie. And shout out to all the singers in this film because they were great. 
I feel like sometimes the vocalists in Disney films are coached to hold back a bit, especially kind of like in the 80s and maybe early 90s films. And now it feels like they get to show off a little bit more. Um, I, I saw some video of Howard Ashman coaching Jody Benson um, in a recording session for The Little Mermaid, like on Part of Your World, or Part of That World. It's interesting because he, he did want her to pull it back and make it like a little more intimate. And though I think that's very effective and dramatic, at the same time, as a musician, I want these performers to have the opportunity to really show what they can do. And I realize you don't just always want to be belting. I get that. But at the same time, we want some range out of the characters, vocal range, not just dramatic range. I liked that they like they let Mirabel be um, you know, a character who had a lot of emotional depth, but she also was able to really open up and sing. She had a couple of moments where she got to show off, and I really, really enjoyed those moments. They let a lot of the singers do the same thing in the movie. And my dog is barking right now. I have a greyhound. Okay, I have one more thing to say about musical connections in this film, and it is about the family name Madrigal. Now, I am not a Spanish speaker myself, but I looked up Madrigal to see if it meant anything in Spanish, and according to Google Translate, at least, it says it doesn't. So it must just be their name. Well, as a musician, I instantly thought of Renaissance part songs for voices, their acapella, they're called madrigals. And so that's right where my mind went. And so I kind of reflected on that after the film. What does that mean to me? Was that an intentional? I mean, it's got to be intentional because like everything they do is intentional, right? In these films. So madrigals are, are part songs for voices and they often have very elaborate counterpoint without instrumental accompaniment. And as I reflected on that, I thought, you know, that's kind of a good analogy for the madrigal family because they are all these different voices and parts that are that have to collaborate. They have to sing together and actually work together. Even when it is complex counterpoint and they're doing complex things, they still have to function as one composition, one piece together. There was a line um, in the lyrics for Mirabel and she sings something about her family, our stars in the constellation. And I think that voice parts in a madrigal are exactly the same thing. So for me, I think it was intentional that their name was the family Madrigal. Um, but again, who knows what the filmmakers were thinking when they made it. Okay, so I can tell you all day what I think about this as an adult, but what probably matters most is what do kids think about Encanto? Well, our children are six and seven years old, and this film easily held their attention for the full 109 minute runtime. They were engaged, they were interested, they were totally into it, and they never got distracted at all. They laughed, they connected with the characters, and they were eager to sing the songs from the film at home. So that's definitely a good sign. I think this film will be a solid entry into the library of Disney feature-length animated films. For me, it struck kind of a similar tone to Moana, and it's not just because of the shared composer. It was more playful than, say, Frozen 2 or Coco, but it had more heart for me than Rapunzel or Brave. Uh, Mirabelle as a character feels very relatable, and I think a lot of people will see a bit of themselves in her. She's a great role model for kids, but she's also mature enough to be relatable for adults and just a little less modern in her mannerisms than Moana which was kind of a welcome change for me. There were times where I felt like Moana was acting a little too much like a modern 14 year old, one of my eighth grade students, and I'd like her to act a little bit more like a character in a classic Disney film. And I thought that Mirabel struck that balance just perfectly. You know, if you watch our channel at all, you know we are huge Disney Parks fans, in particular Disney World. We go there quite a bit. And uh, so I do have some suggestions. I really hope they're going to incorporate these characters and this film into the Disney parks. I really think these characters could be great. Also, the house, uh, the casita, is beautiful and just so cool, and it's a character all on its own. Can we please have the Madrigal casita somewhere? Please, 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 Disney, please build it. I want to go there. Also, any film that has rats 
and a capybara is a winner in my book. I like rodents. Hello, Mickey Mouse, right? And I love rats. Remy, oh, love Remy. He's awesome. I used to keep rats as pets when I was in college, and so this film for me was rat-tastic. Yeah, the rats were not like a major thing. It was just kind of a minor side thing, but oh, I love rats. They're so cute, and that capybara, also adorable. It's not relevant to the story at all. It's just super cute. So overall, I really enjoyed Encanto. It was a beautiful film with rich colors, immersive settings, memorable music, and a story that is both thought-provoking and relatable. Should you go out and see this in theaters? I think it's well worth the price of the ticket, but with only a 30-day wait for it to come out on Disney+, Plus, it's not absolutely necessary. Most people are so busy, they'll easily be able to wait for this star to take its place among the Disney Plus constellation. Even if you don't go to see this film right away, I would recommend that you buy the soundtrack now because it's really, really fun. Be sure to tell us in the comments below what you thought of Encanto if you've seen it already. If not, how do you plan on watching it? Will you be going to the theater or waiting for it to come out on Disney Plus on December 24th? Check out our other videos on our channel right here if you love Disney and music. Thanks so much for joining us today. Bye, everybody.